Hello, hello. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Bill Venners, and I'm here to talk about simplicity in Scala design. And um, a little bit about me. I've been uh, developing, uh, doing, involved with Scala uh, for quite some time now, uh, historically speaking. I helped uh, Martin Lederski and Lex Spoon uh, write the programming in Scala book, the stairway book, and my company, Artima, published it. And um, I spent a lot of time developing a test framework called Scala Test. And uh, today I'm actually going to uh, show some counterexamples of what is not simple. And I'm, most times I'm actually going to show a Scala test so that I criticize my own design decisions and, uh, instead of someone else's. But occasionally I couldn't find something in Scala test, so I will also pick on some other uh, libraries. But um, and the other thing is uh, Dick Wall and I founded Escalate Software where we do uh, Scala training and consulting. And uh, the reason I kind of thought this would be a good time to have this talk is because uh, Scala has been enjoying a very vibrant and healthy early adopter phase, but it seems to be gaining some momentum. And uh, if it's to actually cross the hurdle and get to the uh, early majority, I can never remember that one, um, it's actually those people need different things than early adopters. So I, I want to talk about what I think designing for industry means and how to use Scala effectively for, for that. And um, it's really not earth shattering. I mean, what I'm going to say today should, should be obvious, but I think it, you know, we need a reminder from time to time. And uh, it's just the simple idea that programmers are people. And when you design libraries and frameworks for them, uh, you need to consider human factors and uh, apply that to library design. Um, so I'm going to kind of aim it at people designing published libraries that, that people use. Uh, in the, in the community, but it actually is all applicable to if you're the architects on your team that internally and you're creating things, uh, frameworks and libraries uh, internally, it, the same kind of uh, guidelines apply. So um, the main thing uh, I think is it, the way to think about it is you, you want to try to design things so you simplify your users' lives in some, re some way and um, make it you know, they're trying to achieve some goal, and you just, when they use your library, it's easier for them to get there. Um, so all the things I'm going to say today are my opinion. They're, they're things I've, the way I do things, the way I think about it. So I, I hope it will start a conversation, but this isn't, uh, this is my opinion. Um, at the end, we'll have, I'll leave time for discussion so you could debate me if you want. Um, so another thing I think that is important to keep in mind is that interesting software is written by, not by individuals, but by teams. And so you need to design for teams, and that's uh, enable people to work together effectively. And teams change over time, so people leave and people come, and people get borrowed by their projects or quit their job. Um, and they're busy doing something else. So uh, the early adopter user is actually pretty into Scala. They're into type systems. They're maybe into your library. Um, but people in the more mainstream industry are really not into you. Uh, they are into uh, whatever they're into. They're, they're into how they're passionate about figuring out how to design a more efficient, fuel efficient airplane wing or how to find a cure for cancer or whatever it is they're trying to do. And they want to use your library to help them get there. And I think uh, a lot of library design in Scala so far has really kind of assumed that the user is also going to be an expert in your library. And I think most users are actually casual users. They, they're occasional users, and they're not experts in your library, not because they wouldn't be interested in it, but they just don't have time. They, they're really interested in something else. Um, and a good way I like to think about it is, is renting a car. So when I go on a trip, uh, sometimes I'll rent a car. And usually when I get in that car, I've never been in that kind of car before ever. But I. With, by just kind of looking around for uh, a minute or two, I can usually figure out how to start the car and drive off, right? The, car, the rental car helps me get where I really want to go. I don't care to become an expert in that make or model of car, right? Um, and even though there's a manual in the, in the glove compartment, I have never read the manual before I drive off in a rental car. Right? And it's important uh, to have documentation. I think like that, documentation is one example of how Users who are early adopters are different from sort of the next phase of adoption. Uh, early adopters actually would rather have the code without documentation often uh, than wait until you get it documented to release it because they, they're happy just to look at the source code and figure it out. Um, the, the, the next phase folks, early majority folks, would 
really like some stability, they'd like it to be documented before you release it, right? But um, you really want to make it so that they don't have to check the documentation. Just like when you get in a rental car, it's just kind of obvious how to use it and you go use it. You don't have to check the documentation. So an example I had for that is uh, this is, uh, I'm going to complain about my own design here. Uh, these are two ways, two things you could actually say and it will compile in Scala test. Um, so I'm going to just show them on the interpreter and, and if I say 21 should be, uh, what did I say? 20 plus or minus, fi minus 5. It uh, does what you would expect. It doesn't blow up with a, a test failed exception. But if I change that to equals, I mean equal, um, which looks like it should work, it actually fails. And the reason, what I thought was a good idea, was that um, I wanted something in matchers that always called double equals so that you would know that if you used, you know, should equal, it would always call double equals and didn't have a bunch of special cases. Uh, but about two or at least two times and maybe three times, people have actually said, hey, there's a bug here, this doesn't work. And then they, they, I point them to the documentation, which actually says that's how it works. So it's working as specified. And they say, oh, stupid user error. But I think actually it's my fault because this actually requires that they, they look at the documentation. It doesn't work like it you'd think it would work, right? So that's an example of trying to uh, uh, make things just sort of easy to figure out without reading the documentation. Um, so <clears throat> another thing I, I think you, you can do with Scala is you, Scala's got a, it's sort of got a lot of flexibility and a lot of power and what you can do with that is, is use it to make client code clear and I think that's really one of the ideas of of having all these things in the language that you can really change make the code look like you ever however you want it so you can do that to make code clear and the way I, I try to make code clear is these three things it's the first thing I try to do is make it obvious so like when you see in the code 21 should be 20 plus or minus 5 I think that's obvious right you don't have to look it up um, sometimes you can't make it obvious and then you, the, the, the fallback is to make it guessable so that if you look at the code, you're like, I'm not sure what that is, but I think it would probably mean this. And whatever that is, that's what it means, right? Make it guessable. And if you can't make it guessable, which sometimes it's hard to do that, um, the last thing is to just make it easy to remember. Because that means when they look at it in the code, they're going to have to, if they're reading the code, they're going to have to look it up. But it'd be nice if they just looked it up once. Um, what you want to avoid is every time they see that in the code, they have to look it up to try and remember what it meant. Right. Um, so one of the things I considered when I did this plus or minus, for example, is using uh, operator instead. Um, so this plus slash minus was the one I thought about, but I was worried that people would look at that and not know what it meant, and they'd have to look it up. Um, since then, some users have requested that, that operator B in B, the plus slash minus. And I actually went around and did an informal survey. I would show people B and C and ask them what it means, and they are always able to guess it means plus or minus. Um, the letter D is, is another one I considered because that, that would be the best. That's the mathematical symbol for plus minus and you could do that in Scala because it's a Unicode character, right? So you can make a method with that name. The trouble is that a lot of times they don't render right so if you print it out or to the, sc the screen or open it in an editor, it'll uh, more often than not look like E because they don't know how to render that, right? And that's pretty bad. That actually is very hard to guess what that, that question mark stands for. So I'm not going to do D, but I did decide to do C. And that was the kind of process I went through. I'm, I'm going to switch this from something I think that is obvious to something that is guessable. Okay. So code is read and it is written. And in, in my theory is that it's read more than it's written, though I don't have actual scientific evidence of that. But that's sort of what I base my, my philosophy on. So I think both activities are very important and you want to try to design to make both writers and readers happy. Um, sometimes those two tasks, some of those two uh, users roles are intention, right? So um, if, they, if they are intention, what I try to do is resolve that tension to find some, some way that they can make them both equally happy. But if I can't, and sometimes it's hard to do, um, I favor the reader over the writer. So. For example, in this plus or minus, it was verbose. It's kind of a pain to write because you've got to write plus or minus. But the reader knows exactly what it means. Right? So that was a case of sort of favoring the, the writer over the reader. Um, I'm sorry, 
favoring the reader over the writer. And this is another one. In, in scholar tests, you can also say invoke private. Uh, I think it, it should be re very rare that you want to test a private method. Most of the times you shouldn't. Uh, but every now and then it's actually useful. So I put this thing in there so that you, know, you could have a tool to help you do it more, more, uh, more nicely. And <clears throat> the syntax is, instead of a dot, ob decorate is a private method. So on some object, instead of saying object.decorate, I can't, that won't compile because it's private. I can say object invoke private decorate, right? And I considered what, you know, what that operator should be in the middle. And I chose invoke private, even though it's, it's really long-winded, because it's, uh, to the reader, it's really obvious what it means. One of the other things I considered was that lightning bolt operator. I thought, well, I could make a lightning bolt operator, symbolic operator, that means you know, lightning strikes this thing and the private method gets invoked, right? But that seemed kind of non-obvious to me. And I figured it was, not, it was not guessable and it was even hard to remember because this is supposed to be used rarely. So you would rarely see it as a reader and you would forget. Um, another possibility, because this invoke private is so long, is to make a shorthand like priv that is kind of hints that it might have something to do with privacy. Um, I don't think it's guessable, but it might be more rememberable. It would be rememberable if you use this a lot. Right? So if, if, if this syntax I expected to be used all the time, I would probably have done C. But because I thought it would be used very rarely, or kind of wanted it to be used rarely, I chose A. Um, and that, I think, favors the, the reader over the writer. Um, so another thing, uh, given that programmers are people, and people make mistakes, therefore programmers make mistakes. Um, so you want to try and render those impossible, if possible. And if it's not possible to make it impossible, make it difficult to make an error. Um, and, and this is really uh, the view that your users are, maybe sometimes they, they're in a room with classical music playing and a pot of tea brewing, and you know, they have plenty of time to play around with your library, but a lot of times they're crawling through the mud with bullets whizzing over their head. They've got deadlines, and they've got pressure, and they, they, they're in a hurry, and they make mistakes. Um, so um, one of the things I did in Scala Test to try and uh, prevent errors was um, I wanted uh, tests to be able to be run in parallel because um, CPU speeds aren't getting faster so much anymore, but we're getting more cores, and tests are usually embarrassingly parallelizable. But if you are running tests in parallel, they kind of need to be thread safe somehow, or they're, they're, you have to worry about that. And I thought that was hard. It's hard to get that right. A lot of people don't know how to do it. And so the first thing I did is I made sequential the default. Uh, so unless you ask for running in parallel, you don't get parallel at all. When you do ask for running in parallel, it doesn't actually run tests in parallel in the same test class. It runs the, each test class can run, two test classes can run in parallel. But the tests inside those test classes will run sequentially. And only if you mix in this parallel test execution trait do you get tests to run in parallel. But there the problem is, even though I try to recommend using writing tests in a functional style where you wouldn't have shared mutable state between tests, people will do it. And there's the, the problem of they could have a concurrency bug in their test class, right? Unless they made it, they synchronized access to those things. So I had parallel test execution extend one instance per test, which means that each test gets in its own instance. So even if you write tests to uh, have shared mutable state between them, um, they actually won't interfere with each other if those tests are run in parallel because each one is in, is in its own instance. So that was like, it's not impossible to screw it up. You can still screw it up. Um, but I tried to make it hard. And, and the other thing you can do is Scala has a pretty rich, rich type system. And you can use the type system to prevent errors. So um, one thing is like parallel test execution, you can mix it into any style traits. Scala has, has different styles of uh, traits for testing. And um, you can mix it into any sort of Scala test native style, but it doesn't work when you use JUnit Suite. Because this thing called JUnit Suite um, is really, you, it, you JUnit Suite passes the whole thing to JUnit and let it, let, lets it do the execution, and JUnit doesn't understand parallel test execution. So if I say class my suite extends JUnit Suite, it's kind of small, I'm going to raise it, but uh, with parallel test execution, um, what happens, if I spell it right, 
is it gets a compiler error. So um, using the compiler to flag errors is the best because then it can never get out the door, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's something you can do in a statically typed language. Um, familiarity, I think, is the main reason I can get in a car and drive off, even though I've never been in that car before. So it's it's very useful way to make things simple for people is make it like it was like they did it before, but one problem with that is sometimes what you're trying to do by making a library is change people's behavior, uh, so you think they should do it a different way, and that's going to be unfamiliar. So what you can do there is is make the stuff you don't care what you don't think is important for them to change similar, so that feels comfortable, and change just the parts you think are important to have them change. So uh, an example there is the Java language itself. Um, James Gosling, on several occasions, uh, I heard him talk about um, how he did that in the Java language. Uh, he one time called Java a well-orchestrated fraud. I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Um, and what he meant by that is that he wanted to change C programmers' behavior. He thought they were spending way too much time chasing down memory bugs and that they should use garbage collectors. Right? But they didn't want to, we didn't want to, because we were afraid that if I, let, if I use a garbage collector, it's not going to, if I don't control the memory management myself with my own ten fingers, then uh, we're gonna, it's not gonna, I'm not going to have acceptable performance. Right? That was what was in everybody's head. So what he said he did is he made Java look a lot like C, like curly braces look the same, the for loop looked the same, a lot of things looked the same, but there's no way to free memory anymore. So, um, so I think that's a useful technique to, you know, it, it, familiar to can't, is a straitjacket if you make, try to make everything familiar, but you don't have to make everything familiar, right? You just have to make uh, some of it familiar. Um, so, uh, for example, in Scala test, this thing called fun suite feels X unit ish, right? Um, and that's familiar, and so people feel comfortable. But it has one difference that is what I think is important, which is it encourages people to write descript have focus tests with descriptive names. And so I'm changed, I tried to change that behavior, try to get people to, to write descriptive test names. And the reason is I think that when a test fails, what makes a team productive is usually, sometimes it's, a lot of times it's not the person who wrote the test. So now when the test fails, you've got to figure out what the heck was in the head of the person who wrote that test. And it's really helpful if the test is focused on just one idea, and if they wrote out in the string, like what, what would they were thinking, right? So, so that's a kind of a, an example of, of changing one thing but leaving the other familiar. Um, a couple others is that if there's something already in the Scala library that you can extend, then that's a good way to help people understand how to use your, your construct. So, um, for example, the top line there is how you can compose matchers in Scala test. End with is a matcher, so I say end with ext compose, and then I pass it a function, and I get a new matcher back. And what compose is, is it's actually a method defined on function one in Scala, in the Scala library. A matcher is a function. So when you do matcher composition, you're really just doing function composition, you're sort of reusing that same exact concept. And a lot of people will already be familiar with that, but even if you're not familiar with that, what you're going to have to look up is not something in Scala test. You'll have to look something up in Scala, and you will learn something generally useful about Scala. Um, and then it's just easier to remember how to use it. Uh, uh, the, the other example is this table concept. This is how you do um, data-driven tests in Scala test. You say, uh, I say val examples equals table, and then I have a tuple of, of column headers and then I have a list of tuples with the data in them. And then you can say for all examples, um, n should be less than d or something, right? You make a, a property check statement about it. Um, well, what if you have a file full of, CS, a CSV file full of data with commas in between them, and you want to parse that data in and then stick it in a table somehow and uh, then do a for all property check on it? Table is a seek of tuples. So this one is a tuple too. Um, so inside uh, the table that comes back, examples, the type of examples is going to be table, um, uh, table for two, actually. And that extends seek of uh, tuple to int comma int, right? So 
because everybody knows how to use a seek, they actually know how to stick things in a table. You just create an empty table, and then you plus plus in the elements you parsed out of the file. Right? So it makes it easier to use because it's familiar. Um, so although people don't read the documentation, they don't read the manual, I think they do consult it when they have to. And one of the things they really like to see is examples. And uh, so, for example, examples. And uh, so, for example, I'll show you. Uh, what I try to do is, um, it's not just writing the text, but to give people examples really helps them. Um, this is just out of the Scala doc for flat spec. And I always have a package name there because we, we, we store all these in packages and make sure they compile. That's one thing people like. Um, but if you just copy and paste this into the interpreter, you can run it. Or you could copy it and paste uh, it into your own code. And that's what people really like to do. They like to be able to copy and paste um, because they're in a hurry. And it's also a good way to get people to change their behavior. If you only show examples with the desired, you know, the way you think they should do it, that's how they're going to do it because they're, I don't want to say lazy, but they're busy and it's the, you know, the quick way to get it done, right? So, um, all right. Sorry, all right. Sorry, it was too, uh, too difficult to resist. So, um, I think you should, th there's something in the, in the Python community, which I like, which let me see if I can find that one. community, which I like, which let me see if I can find that one. It's PEP20, they actually had a, a I don't know how this ended up being a PEP, but um, uh, this which is the, the Python equivalent to a SIP, which is Scala Improvement Proposal. But uh, it says right there, the blue highlighted one, there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. I think that's a good idea. Um, and the reason is, is if you make people choose that, they're going to have to go look up information to figure out which one to choose, and that takes time, right? Uh, so, right. Uh, so, um, the trouble is that if there's a certain kind of redundancy that I think is good. So this is, a, I took a picture of my screwdrivers. Um, about almost three years ago, or maybe two and a half years ago, my toolbox disappeared when some workers came to do some work in our house, so I had no tools. So I decided I would only buy a new tool when I needed one. So, so far, this is how many screwdrivers I've had to get, have to buy. Would it, my toolbox be simpler if I just had one? Right, because this is a kind of redundancy, right? Um, it would make it easier to choose which screwdriver I'm going to use, but if, if my one screwdriver is a flathead, and what I need to screw into the wall is a Phillips needs a Phillips screwdriver, I'm, uh, out of, I'm screwed uh, out of luck, right? So uh, this kind of redundancy, I think, is good. And what we should really want to do is, is uh, find the minimum number of things that solves the maximum number of problems. But each one needs to solve a different problem. Even though there can be overlap, like here, there, you know, if I have one screw I need to screw in, there may be two or three screwdrivers that could solve it. That's going to happen. But what you want to try to do is just make sure you cover all the bases with the fewest choices. Um, what you really want to avoid is this, right? which is a bunch of different screwdrivers that really all solve the same problem. And all it is is I feel like a blue handle versus a, a yellow handle or something. Um, but one of the problems I had in Scala test, so Scala test has some choice. It has multiple style traits, and it describes multiple ways to re factor out shared code in tests to reduce duplication. Um, and what I discovered is people had problems choosing because everything was buried in the details. So let me show you an example. Um, so let me show you an example. Um, I actually had to do something on the plane. Um, which required that I pick a collection out of Java Util Concurrent. So on the flight over here, I finally had time to do this. There was one actor in Scala test, and in 2.10, they moved the actors library out of Java, uh, Scala-library.jar. So if you use actors, you need to have another jar, Scala-actors.jar, in your class path, which I thought was a pain, and I was just using it to serialize events. Um, so I said, well, I've got to get rid of that so I can get rid of that, that jar file. And I'll just use something from Java Util Concurrent. Well, Java Util Concurrent's got a lot of stuff in it. It's got a bunch of different collection types. And they're each focused on solving a different problem. So it's that kind of redundancy. But now I have the problem of like, picking one. And to pick it, I'm going to have to go through and read like, a lot of text here. I'm going to look at the next one, read a lot of text here. Right? And so what I did, I decided to bring Brian Getz's book on the plane, even though it's heavy. 
because it had a chapter on these collections, and I was able to sort of get an overview. Collections, and I was able to sort of get an overview. So what I think is important is if you do have uh, a lot of screwdrivers like this, that you make it easier for people to pick them and to see the difference. So I added these little call-out boxes at the top of this different style trays to say, that's, this is what this one's for, to make it real quick to see what it was for. So you don't have to read all the text. Um, and, um, and I also added a little um, table of, you know, a summarizing the style traits and what they're for in one place on the user guide. And a similar thing shows up in, in Scala's uh, documentation for the collections library. There's a lot of different collections, right? And again, they're, they're each different in, this, in how their performance characteristics are. And so depending on your situation, one will make more sense than the other. There's a table you can look up. This is in the Scala, the programming in Scala book, but it's also on the web. Uh, it just says, here's all the types and here's their performance characteristics and that can help you quickly choose. So, okay. Okay, another thing that helps people is consistency. Um, if they learn how to do something over here, it helps them if it works the same way over there because, they don't, because they're going to try to do it that way over there. Um, and if they do figure out that, oops, that's not how you do it over there, they have to keep switching back and forth, right? And that, that just makes things harder to use. Um, so what, uh, I'm going to show you a way where I did not achieve consistency in Scala test um, and how I finally figured out how to resolve it. Uh, the way you, you can use this uh, given when then uh, style in Scala test by mixing in a trait called given when then. And the way that works is the given and the when and the then and the and uh, method call actually takes an implicit parameter that's passed in invisibly at the end. And that is provided by the, the fun suite in this case, right? So fun suite provides one, feature spec provides one. Basically every style trait provides one except suite. So that one was inconsistent. And the reason was is that suite was, I wanted it to be, suite is the base of all the style traits. So fun suite extends suite and fun spec extends suite. So it's up here and I wanted it to be stateless so that there would be no overhead that it would add, just like no memory overhead. And um, its, it's methods are, are just default implementations of, of what I call lifecycle methods. And the way it allowed people to write tests was uh, as methods. I thought it was important to have a, a style where tests were methods. Um, so it, was, it will actually look to discover methods that start with tests like JUnit 3 did. But there was no implicit informer in scope because I didn't want to have state. So what I said is, well, okay, in this one it's going to be different. Um, you can pass in an informer. You can declare your method to take one, and I'll pass it in. Skull test will pass it in. So it works. This actually works. But it's different, and that bugged me for, for several years. Uh, um, and the other thing that bugged me about this is this is what was the one style trait that didn't encourage descriptive test names, right? Because these are camel case test names are a pain to write, right? So what I figured out finally was that the real problem is, the problem with my design was that I was trying to do too many things in suites, was that class has too many responsibilities problem. And so the way to fix that is to factor out one of the responsibilities to a different class. So in 2.0, I have deprecated suite as a style trait. You, you will not be able to use it at, to write tests anymore. It will only have the role of uh, base class of, the, of all the styles. So in that role, it, it wants to be stateless. In, you know, in the role of the base trait for all the styles, it wants to be stateless. And the other role it was trying to play, which is uh, how to write tests as methods, it actually wanted to have state. So um, I factored that into this guy and changed how you define, how it, how it determines um, a method is actually a test. And this is an idea that Coda Hale came up with, which is you can write a test method uh, in backticks, and then you can actually write it out with spaces and everything. So um, this guy, because he's not the base class of the family, it's okay if he has state. So he has state just like the other style traits. So now given when then uh, is, uh, it, using given when then is consistent everywhere. Okay. Um, and I wanted to show another one that happened to me just recently. Um, when I say uh, set in Scala, in Scala, I'm going to actually do it over here, 
Um, let me make the size a little bigger. Oh, that's smaller. That's weird. Oh, that's because I had minus. Okay, here we go. A little bit bigger so you can see it better. Um, when I say set, if I say set of one, two, three, um, I get a immutable set, and that is Scala is kind of nudging you towards the functional style. Um, if I say map of one, uh, one to two, let's say, um, I get an immutable map. But if I say seek, this is uh, the 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 sequence, the sequence, right, that has a, an index. I actually it doesn't say what I get, which makes it a little even less obvious. But what I get is the general set is the general one that can be mutable. So I. That actually led me to make a mistake. I, I wanted to have a type returned uh, from Scala test that's an immutable index seek. And I just said index seek because I was thinking it was the same way as the other ones. Right? Because it was inconsistent, I made a mistake. And there's, there's good reasons, actually, for why they did that. Um, but, it, but it will, that kind of inconsistency, uh, if you can get it out of your design, will help keep people from making mistakes. OK. Oh, yes, so um, actually one of the real reasons I wanted to do this talk was to be able to talk about symbolic operators, because when I look around, that's probably the main, one of the biggest um, problems for, uh, I can never remember the name of these guys, early majority people. This is like, this is from the Crossing the Chasm book. You've got the early adopters, and then there's a chasm that's really hard to get over, and then there's the early majority, um, and they, they have, they're different. Uh, so what I think um, you should, the real good way to think about symbols, which is like uh, using uh, asterisks and stars and pluses and all that, is to use them when your users are already experts in them. That's a good rule of thumb. If they're already experts in them, that's a good use case. So an example is, the top line here is Scala code for doing a squared plus b squared um, with java.math.biginteger. And the, the lower line is how you say a squared plus b squared with scala.math.beginager, right? So which one's nicer? I mean, I think the second, the lower line is nicer. But the reason is, is because all of us are already experts in what star and plus mean in this context. We already know what that means. So that's a nicer way to write it. Um, and Again, I wanted to complain about my own des design decision. Uh, there, there's another test framework called Specs, uh, which there were two flavors of them, one and two. And, and this, this is done by Eric Torobori. And, and both him and I wanted to get all the clutter out of the specification. Uh, both he and I wanted to do that. Um, so four or five, before, it's like 2007, I did this. I thought, you know, I think I'm going to just use operators, uh, get rid of all the words, and only have text be the uh, the specification. So you can say a stack should pop values in last and first out order, and that's all you see. Um, so I decided to do this, and then I realized maybe a month later that this was not a good idea because it's going to be really hard for people to, to even see the difference between two dashes and one dash and to remember the difference. And it was just kind of too non-obvious. So I changed my mind, but unfortunately I had uh, in, in the intervening time, sent the PDF of the programming in Scala book to the printer with one of these examples in it. <laughs> so I wanted all the code to compile and work in that book. So I actually released this in 0.9.4, deprecated already, and I said don't use it, and I took it out in 0.9.5, but just so that everything would compile. And what I ended up with doing a few years later that I think worked was this instead. Um, it's called free spec because it's sort of free verse and um, to introduce a test, I say in, and that is consistent with uh, word spec and f um, flat spec in Scala test, and it's consistent with specs one and specs two. They, well, we all say in to introduce a test. So that, I think, people, uh, is pretty obvious to people. And then I only need one other character, and I ended up using the dash. Um, and here, even though that's a non-obvious operator, I think it's guessable from the context. Like when you look at that, you're going to say, well, what that dash is doing is just introducing that scope. You know, all the tests inside that are going to mean be related to a stack. So um, that's, I think, you know, uh, this was, uh, this happens a lot where people use operators that are non-obvious. Um, and so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, SBT, its use of operators, because um, I think that some of them actually work pretty well. 
and others don't. So just to kind of give you an insight into to how to kind of think about it, or a suggestion to how to think about it, um, this name colon equals dude. Um, if I need to change the name of my project, and my project is currently named dude, um, I could look at the build file and pretty much figure out that I need to go change that dude string to something else. And this colon equals, it's kind of complicated what it means actually, but it looks like assignment, looks kind of like Pascal, and you can think of it that way and it'll work. Right? So I think that operator works very well. Um, the plus equals uh, is actually fine. That means I'm, I'm adding an element to, a, to something. I don't have to necessarily know what it is, um, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, plus plus equals on the next line is I'm adding a, a collection of things in, and that's very consistent. That's consistent with Scala uh, a collection library, even if it's not exactly meaning that. Um, and you can think of it that way, and it works. This percent sign doesn't mean percent. It means something completely made up in, in SBT. It's how you say uh, Maven group ID, artifact ID, or group name, artifact ID, and version. Um, but I think it works because anybody who looks at this source code, they're going to see, they see a bunch of group ID, artifact ID, and version numbers. They, and they recognize that from, from, from Maven. Right? from their past experience, it's familiar. So they can guess what that percent sign means. Right? The double percent is not really guessable, um, but I think that turns out to be easy to remember. Right? So I think that one works. What that one means is they're going to stick, uh, SPT will stick an underscore Scala version name after the artifact ID. And I don't think people have a problem with that. Where people have trouble is things like tilde equals less than less than equals less than plus equals less than less than plus plus equals because they're not obvious. They're not um, guessable and they're hard to remember, especially if you're, if you're actually uh, in a build file. People don't work with it every day. They work with it now and then. By the time they go back to it, they, they have to look it up again. So it's a case of the, where you have to look it up each time. Right? Um, and another thing I wanted to mention that people do is they say, well, okay, so slash colon, that's uh, another, these are two ways to say fold left in Scala. Slash colon is a non-obvious operator. And then if you don't like that one, you can also use the fold left word, right? And so people um, do that to give users a choice. And they think, you know, that, that way people who don't like the, the symbol can use the word. The trouble with that, I think, is that readers don't actually get a choice. Right? And code's read more than it's written. So if someone says slash colon, then everybody has to look at that and try to remember what it means. And so I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think it, you know, I think if, if you're not, if your symbol is, is uh, not clear enough that you feel the need to actually make a word as an alternative, you probably maybe shouldn't be making the symbol. And I'll, I'll give you another uh, sort of uh, thought experiment to see if I can convince you of that. A, imagine A and B are ints. We have a way to say a squared plus b squared with stars and pluses, but we actually don't have a way to say words. Right? I can't actually say a multiply a add b multiply b on ints. Shouldn't I be able to do that so that people have a choice? <coughs> no. That, you know, clearly, the star and the plus are better. Um, that's the kind of situation where you should use the symbol and not the word. Otherwise, maybe you should use the word and not the symbol, I think. So, <clears throat> um, so that's, that's, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, just before I go on, I think that's an, an, a very important one for early adopters are a lot more tolerant of non-obvious uh, operator symbol names. And uh, the mainstream uh, programming community, I don't think, will be as much. So, um, okay, so another thing I wanted to look at was functional versus imperative, because that's something that Scala's both, and, uh, and sort of the community's tried to figure out, well, what's the best way to, you know, when to use functional, when to use imperative, and so on. And I think the way to uh, think about it is you use functional by default. Um, but don't be afraid to use imperative when it helps. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I'm, not everybody agrees with that. Uh, some people really want to turn the functional knob all the way, all the way to functional. Well, turn the knob all the way to functional. And uh, I think probably the best spot for Scala is it's back a little bit from there. Um, so uh, this fun suite 
uh, basically skull test is written with that um, philosophy. It's mostly functional, but there's, there's a few places where it's imperative. And one of them is it has a registration side effect in some of the style traits. Right, so when you say test, 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 what test does is it has a side effect. It registers a test named addition and the function in the curly braces. And then it registers the next one the next time you call test. So that happens at construction time. There's a side effect and it's not functional, right? It's imperative. And then at runtime, when you, when you call run on the suite, it will go through that list and execute them, execute the tests. Um, when I designed, made that design choice, I actually did consider doing it the functional way because I think you always should. You should always look at doing it functionally first. Um, and this is what I came up with, which is test could return, instead of having a side effect, it would need to return something. And it could return an object of type te capital T test, right? And then you could have a, an abstract val tests in fun suite that users would have to uh, define, right? And they would give you a, a, a collection of tests somehow. And so probably you need an operator to connect them. And the one I, I'm pretty sure I was, I had thought was the best one was this caret. Um, caret would mean connect this test to the next one, right? And um, one thing, of course, I don't like, didn't like about it is that there's another non-obvious operator that people aren't going to know what it means. You can kind of maybe guess from the context that I'm connecting, though. Um, so maybe it was okay. But there is one error mode that's not in the, um, the, the side effect one. is if you forget one, which is an easy mistake to make. See how that, that carrot went away because I forgot to type it? It will actually forget about the last one. I can't get that to not compile, even though that's an easy mistake to make. So that was a one downside. And then um, a couple years later, Dick Wall uh, made, uh, suggested, told me there's actually a different operator I could use that is obvious. Um, can anybody guess, say, an obvious operator instead of caret, what I could use? Huh? Plus. Yeah, plus isn't too bad. Um, that wasn't the one he, ha he, he suggested. He suggested cons. Because I think when you look at this, it's really obvious what's going on. Val tests is going to be a list of tests. Um, any Scala programmer is going to know what that means. Um, one thing you get is you get this dot colon const nil boilerplate at the end. Uh, you can get rid of that by putting a const operator on the test class, T-E-S-D. Uh, and uh, the problem is, if you do that, get rid of that boilerplate, now you've got that error mode again. If they leave one of them off, it compiles, it just misses what you what you were trying to put in there. Um, so I think this is actually the best. Um, and another way people could write it is this. Another way to actually connect things is with a comma. And I think that's a good operator. And you could take that even further and have FunSuite be a class with a constructor that takes a var args of these things, and then it would actually look like this. Um, so FunSuite now is a class, and I'm actually passing all this up to the constructor of my superclass. And the problem with this, though, is it really, I can't, FunSuite had to be a trait in my, situ in, in my case because I couldn't burn the base class, it's too uh, inflexible. Um, so, so really the, the best one I think that I could end up with, the functional style is the one on the right, and uh, if you just put them side by side, which one's nicer, right? Um, I thought the one on the left was nicer because uh, it's just, it's what, what's in the user's head is test, 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 and what you see is test, test, test. And this other stuff was a little bit cluttery. Except for one little problem, which is that functional style code can be easier to reason about. Right, uh, and I mean, you hear people say that. I have actually had that experience. Uh, I've been dropped in a code base where there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, and it has to happen in a certain order or it breaks, and as soon as I try to make a change, it breaks because it's too hard to understand what's going on where and who's calling what. Um, so I, I find this is true, but it, it doesn't mean that imperative code isn't reason aboutable. Um, if it's simple, you can actually read reason about it, right? So for example, I think you could probably reason about this code, even though it has a side effect, because it's simple, right? And this one, uh, a little more complicated, I think you could probably get. You see, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm importing something mutable. So that's scary. Um, val buff equals list buffer dot empty. So I'm creating an empty list buffer for i equals one to three plus 
I'm going to plus equals that number into the buff, and then I'm going to say buff for each print line, I'm going to print them out. So what's I going to print out? It's not a trick question. Oh, I don't know how I copy this, copy and paste this. I'll just show it. We'll just try it. Anybody want to be brave enough to guess what this is going to print out? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, I will show you. One, two, three. So if you can keep the side effects simple, um, I think it's actually okay. Uh, that's the important thing if you're going to use a, you know, an imperative style is to try to keep it simple and localized. But this kind of, this kind of, uh, I mean, where's my play here? Play slideshow. This is actually what, about the same level of complexity of this. This is, you know, there's a list buffer behind the scenes. It's, it's behind an atomic reference so that different threads can be doing different things. But at, when the thing's constructed, it sticks not numbers into a list buffer, but it sticks tests in there. And then later when you call run, it, ex it for eaches through them and executes them, sort of. So it's, this, it's, in all these years people have been using this, I've never heard anybody have trouble reasoning about a fun suite. It's just simple enough that they don't have trouble even though it's got a side effect. And I think that is um, really what Scala is. It's, it's not, I mean, you can use it to program uh, in a very ha style similar to Haskell. Um, and it's, there's a lot of really great stuff when you do that, but it really doesn't quite fit as well in Scala as Haskell. So um, I think, you know, the sweet spot for Scala is you turn it up mostly functional, but not quite all the way. <laughs> And this is from the Scala book. It's, uh, it just says, you know, prefer vowels, immutable objects, and methods without side effects. Reach for them first. But don't be afraid to uh, use the immutable, or the mutable objects, vars, and methods with side effects when you have a specific justification, when they make things better. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to close with was, um, I think Scala is different in that it gives you a lot of it gives you a magic wand that we didn't have before in Java. Um, like, for example, this week the play, the guys who did the play framework were talking about how when they first wrote it, they wrote it in Java. And they had to do a lot of bytecode manipulation, do magic in bytecode ma manipulation to make things simple for the user. But they don't have to do that in Scala because the compiler gives them the magic wand. They can do it in the language, right, and make things simple for the user. And what, I, what I've observed in, in our early adopter phase is that, it, you know, Scala's got a lot of really interesting knobs and people want to touch them and turn them and use them, right? So I think the thing to do is to, to really be uh, conservative and restrained about how you use that magic wand. And um, last week, Dick Wall told me a story which fit perfectly. He said when he was about 10 years old, uh, he walked in, uh, his dad was, uh, had a... Uh, a drill, he was drilling a hole in wood by hand. And he asked his dad, well, why are you drilling a hole, why are you using the, the hand drill when you have an electric drill? And his dad said, remember what tools are for, they are for solving problems, not finding problems to solve. And um, I think in, you know, in the early adopter phase, it's filled with people who are really excited about Scala and about all its features and about type systems. And, and um, the users were about, were we're like that to a great extent too, but if, if it's going to go across the chasm and sort of be more mainstream, they're not so interested in that. They just want to get the job done. So you want to use the minimum magic that gives the maximum usability because the more magic you put in there actually adds complexity uh, to, to the user's lives, to the, to the program. Um, and that is my talk. So I've got eight minutes for questions or comments or debate. Does anybody have? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Anybody disagree with anything? No, oh, great. Well, I convinced you all. I can't see hands, so I have to wave. All right, going once, you can come up and ask me later if you don't want to debate publicly. No? All right, well, thank you for coming. <laughs>